good morning. Welcome to International. My name is Scott Custer. For those of you who are guests here, I'm the lead pastor here. And thank you very much, Lauren, for sharing that. That's one of my favorite worship songs. It is excellent. Thank you. You did a wonderful job. Thanks, Scott Wells, for sharing your story. And thank you, Laura and the Keiki, for helping us know more about the Wolof people. If you have been with us over the last few weeks, then you know that we are currently studying the topic of salvation. And we're calling the series 38 Wonders in One Moment. And we're looking at the 38 things that happen to us the moment we trust in Christ. The instant we believe, the instant we say, I believe Jesus is the Son of God and the only way to God, God instantly gives us these 38 spiritual gifts that was talked about in Ephesians 1.3. He blesses us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly realms. Well, what are those? Well, that's kind of what we're exploring and if you were with us last week, today's wonder is actually going to be slightly tied to last week's. Today's wonder is that God frees me from the law. Well, last week we learned that God made us alive with Christ. He makes us alive the instant we trust in him. And we see this connection between last week and this week at the turn from Romans 6 into Romans 7. Romans 6, if you want to turn there, feel free. We'll be bouncing around a little bit today, but we'll start off here. Uh, Romans 6.23 says, The wages of sin is death. Talked about that last week. Sin gives birth to death. We are dead in our sins and transgressions. But the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. We were dead, but now we are made alive. We were toast, and now we have victory in Christ. And God makes us a co-participant in Christ's resurrection. That was last week. If you missed it, you can catch it online at our website at inchurch.com. But here's the key thing. When we died, we didn't just die to sin. We've also died to the law. If you have your Bible, like the old school, just jump down a few verses to Romans 7, chapter, uh, verse 4. Paul says, So my brothers and sisters, you also died to the law. Through the body of Christ, that you might belong to one another, to him who was ra- sorry, belong to another, to him who was raised from the dead. Jump down to verse six. By dying to what once bound us, we have been released from the law. All right, Christian, you've been released from the law. You're free from the law. Woohoo! Yeah, party hats. So what? What does that even mean, right? Well, in order to understand the significance of this statement, and that it really is pretty great news, we have to first know what Paul's talking about. What law is he referring to? Almost every time you see the phrase, the law mentioned throughout the New Testament, whether it's in a letter by Paul or whether it's by a character in the gospel narratives, it's almost always referring to the Pentateuch or the first five books of the Bible more generally but kind of to the 613 commandments in those five books more specifically. So the law is kind of referred to as Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. That constituted the law. So that's what they're talking about. They're talking about that generally, but more specifically all the commands that are contained therein. Now God's law was like a standard of living. It was a rule of life. It was, hey, this is kind of an instruction manual. Here's how you are to live. It was to help teach his people right from wrong. God gave the law to Moses for him to give to the people. It was to help them know what's right and wrong. It was to help them as a society set up a just community that would punish wrongdoing, that would uphold virtuous ideals. It was to prepare them for the Messiah. And now God knew that the Israelites were never going to live up to his law. They broke it within seconds of actually getting it. But God had a plan. He had a plan that he was going to save them apart from the law. See, we have to understand this. There are things that God's law can do. There's things that God's law cannot do. And we have to understand the difference. Because if we do not understand how to rightly interpret and understand and handle God's law, we can really hurt ourselves with it. We could even kill ourselves with it. John Piper says this. He explains that Paul says in Romans 9.32, 
that the reason Israel stumbled into destruction was not that they neglected the law, but it's that they pursued the law in the wrong way. They pursued it from works and not from faith. They pursued it in the power of the flesh rather than in the power of the spirit. In other words, moral effort can be mortal sin. Satan clothes himself as an angel of light, and he makes the commandments of God his base of operation. And the human heart is so inveterately proud and so unsubmissive that it often uses religion and morality to express its rebellion. All right, we're going to unpack what that means. But just know this, to start, it's really important to understand what God's law was intended to do and what God's law was not intended to do. I'm going to start with what it was not intended to do. God's law was never intended to save. It was never intended to save. Galatians 3.21, If a law had been given that could impart life, then righteousness could certainly have come by the law. Paul's saying, guys, if there was a law that you could keep that would make you right with God, you would have been given that law. That law would have come, and you could have actually obeyed it. But there's no such law. There is nothing you could do, no rule you can keep that would make you right with God. God gave us the law, gave his people the law to reveal his holy character. So when he says, do not murder, he's saying that because he's a God who values life. He's not saying, hey, as long as you don't murder somebody, you'll inherit eternal life. Just keep this rule and everything between us will be good. That's not what he's saying. It's revealing his character. It's giving them a way to live. Now, the problem is that no human could ever live up to the character of God, right? That bar is way too high. None of us can be perfect as our heavenly father is perfect. But God also can't compromise his character. He can't relax the law. The law that he gave, he gave because it comes out of who he is. His law is closely connected to his character. So he can't diminish his character. He can't diminish the law, the law that he gave to the Israelites. But we have to understand this. The bottom line is this. No one was ever made right with God by keeping rules. God did not give the law to the Israelites so that they could keep the rules and thus become right with him. We have to understand that the law was never intended to save. Now, that's not because the law is weak. That's not because the law is imperfect or the law is fallible. The problem isn't in the law. The problem is in us. The weakness of humanity is what prevents us from rightly keeping God's law. It's not like the law is broken. Oh, it can't save us because there's an issue with it. No, it can't save us because the issue is with us. We can't keep it. So the law of God is perfect. It's a high standard we can't reach, and yet the law of God can't be relaxed. So God had to devise a way of saving sinners without relaxing the law, without compromising his character. And therefore, Romans tells us, it was a righteousness that had to come apart from the law because salvation could never come through it. Keeping rules was never going to get us right with God. That's not what it was for. Okay. So now that we know the law was not intended to make us right with God, why, why did God give it? Well, there's two primary reasons, and one of them is even more important than the other. I'll, I'll actually start with the lesser. First, the law was a temporary restraining guardian. Galatians 3 says that the law was added because of transgressions. That's Galatians 3.19. That's important. The law was added because of transgressions. Sin came first. Then God gave the law. God didn't give the law, we broke the law, and now we've sinned. Sin existed, then God gave the law because of transgressions. Before the coming of the faith in Christ, we were held custody under the law. We were locked up until the faith that was to come would be revealed. And then verse 24 is on your screen. So the law was our guardian until Christ came that we might be justified by faith. Here's what he's saying. The law has a restraining effect on humans. It has a restraining effect on God's people. It it can't save us from sin, but it can deter us 
from sinning even more, right? It can show us the right way to live. God's law, in this sense, is like a speed limit sign. If you're going up and over the poly highway, you'll run into a sign that says 45 miles an hour that informs you that there is a law governing this road that you are to go 45 miles an hour. Now, can that speed limit sign make you go 45 miles an hour? Clearly not, if you've ever driven it. Can that sign save you from the penalty of going 60 miles an hour? No, it cannot. It is there to inform you that the law is 45 miles an hour and to hopefully curb your propensity for speeding and mind by telling us, hey, there is a penalty, there is a fine, there is this law. You should really go 45. It's for your safety and for the safety of others. That's how God's law was to work. Hey, don't, don't murder. <laughs> don't, don't do that. That's not good for you. That's not good for society. That's not how God wants us to live. God's law, at least, is meant to curb some of our pain, curb some of our sinful propensities. It can't save you from your sin. The law can't. And the law can't save you from the penalty, and it can't make you not sin. But maybe it can deter you a little bit. Maybe it can say, hey, guys, now that you know the rule, maybe you'll keep it. Maybe you'll go 45. Maybe, maybe not. But when you do, there's still going to be a penalty for that. So it has kind of a restraining effect on us. Now, the fact that it's temporary is also important. It was a temporary guardian. It was temporarily meant to teach us right from wrong, to discipline us. And this is something that doesn't really translate to our time and culture. In our culture, we value highly the role of parenting, that it's a parent's job to train up a child. Not every culture in the world has felt that way. Greco-Roman culture parenting wasn't that high of a value. And if you could afford it, you actually hired a guardian to raise your kids for you. Who would sign up for that? No, don't don't put your hands up. Uh, It's not good. Um, But that's what what they would do. A guardian would come in and raise your kids, discipline your kids, teach your kids right from wrong, teach your kids how to act in society, prepare your kids for adulthood. And guardians were, if necessary, empowered to also use discipline. So Paul is drawing a metaphor here. Hey, the law that God gave to his people in the Old Testament, it was going to teach God's people how to live rightly. That here is right from wrong. Teach them to do their homework, to teach them to go to school, to teach them how to behave. But it was always meant to be a temporary gift. It was a temporary guardian that was going to go from Moses to Jesus. When Jesus comes, it's like the parent is here. All right, the parent can now take over because now we have someone who not only shows us how to live, not only teaches us how to live, but Jesus can actually empower us to live this way. So the need for the guardian is replaced. The guardianship of the law was temporary and it was restraining. Okay, so we've got that part down. Why is the second reason... An even more important reason for God's law coming. It's this. God's law was intended to illuminate our need. Romans 3.20. No one will be declared righteous in God's sight because of the works of the law. Nobody gets to God by keeping rules. Rather, through the law, we become conscious of sin. So God's law makes us aware of of our sin. Chuck Swindoll explains that the law has clearly defined right and wrong. What was moral, what is immoral, what is godly and what is ungodly. Sin is no longer a matter of human opinion. With the law, it becomes divinely established fact. Now we know that we are transgressors of God's righteous standard, not just breakers of some human speed limit law. Without the law, we wouldn't be able to recognize sin. Without the law, we wouldn't be able to recognize sin. Paul says this in Romans chapter 7. He says, it was the law that showed me my sin. I would have never known that coveting was wrong if the law had said, you shall not covet. But sin used this command to arouse all kinds of covetous desires within me. But if there were no law, sin would not have that power. At one time... 
like when he's talking about when he was a child, he lived without understanding the law. But when I learned the commandment not to covet, for instance, the power of sin came to life and I died. Which is, of course, tied to what we said last week, that the sin brings about death. That's what it always does. So God gives us the law to reveal our sin, to show us that we are sinners. How does it do that? How can the law do that? Here's how. Because the effect of the law is that as soon as you hear it, you want to break it. Right? As soon as you hear the law, you want to break it. No one can break a law that doesn't exist. So to make us aware of our rebellion toward him, God gave us the law. It's kind of like when you see a sign that tells you not to do something. You, you instantly want to do it, right? If you ever go somewhere, it's like, you know, no skateboarding here. Skateboarders everywhere, right? No spitting here, no gum here. Like the sign is covered in gum, right? Or you walk past a bench, it says, do not touch bench. You didn't want to touch the bench. You had no interest in this bench. It was, you couldn't have cared less, but now, oh, now suddenly we care about the bench, right? We want to jump on that bench and stomp all over it and take that sign. Can't rule my life. That's how laws work. <laughs> they bring about and reveal our sin. We instantly want to break whatever rule it tells us to do or not do. The flagship hotel in Galveston, Texas, learned this one the hard way. The hotel is right on the water, and the ground floor has a dining room with these beautiful floor-to-ceiling glass windows overlooking the water. Now, above the dining room are obviously hotel rooms. Well, one genius got the brilliant idea one day to fish off the balcony into the water. So he got his, uh, his gear together, and he hooked up a heavy sinker onto his line and put bait and hook, and he cast off. But his line was too short, so and whew, Smash the $600 window. The hotel went, well, that's not cool. How can we keep this from happening again in the future? I know. We'll put up a sign in all the hotel rooms that says, no fishing from balconies. Can you guess what happened next? Suddenly, everybody was fishing from the balconies. Oh, oh I hadn't thought about that before. And they constantly kept catching people fishing. They had multiple broken windows over and over again. After spending enormous sums of money without fixing the problem, suddenly one day they fixed the problem. They just got rid of the signs from the rooms, and the problem went away overnight. God's law reveals our sin because it's impossible for us to obey all the laws. We want to break them. There's something in that, in us, that reveals our sin. We can't do it. We can't keep rules. We need divine help. No one will be made right with God. No one will be made right with God by keeping rules. It's impossible for any human, Jesus accepted, to keep the rules. And so if you've maybe checked out for this first half, you're like, law, snooze fest. Come back in. This is the main thing I've been trying to say so far. <laughs> Rules can't help us reach God. That was the same in the New Testament. It's the same in the Old Testament. Rules can't help us reach God. Rules reveal the character of the rule maker, and rules reveal the lack of character in you and in me. So the law was not given to make people right with God, but it was to reveal what was wrong with us. And if you see it in that light, you actually see that the, the law was a gift. The law was a means of God's grace that was shown to us because it, it shows us our inadequacies. It reveals to us our need for a Savior. It points us to Christ. Let me borrow this analogy I once heard. You're probably wondering what this ladder is doing up here. Somebody forget to put it away. God gave the law to his people. He said, guys, here's the law. It's a railroad track, all right? God gave his law to his people as tracks to run on. Now, how were they meant to run on these tracks? They were meant to run on it by the grace of God. 
So the engine would be powering this thing would be God's grace and the Holy Spirit. And we would couple ourselves to that engine by faith, by trusting in God and his love. And God was going to lead his people on the track of obedience to him, keeping the laws as a way of life, as a standard for how they ought to live. That's why it was given. And like I said, in the Old Testament and the New Testament, that was the means by which God was going to interact with us in his commandments. These weren't going to make us right with him, but these were how we ought to live. The way we are right, made right with him is through faith. And through faith, we have access to his grace, which empowers us to live the right way. It was meant to be the same for the Israelites as it is for us. However, this way of salvation this way of just trusting God by faith and receiving salvation by grace is so uncomplimentary to our human ego. Oh, we don't like this. No, we don't like it that God has to do all the saving. We want to have a part in it. We want to do something. So the Pharisees, many other Jews, and many people today do an amazing thing with the law of God. These rail road tracks that are put down. They take up the rail, the ties, and they take it off the floor, and they stand it up and down, up against the doorway of heaven. And they say, we are now going to turn this into a ladder to climb. We are going to reach God with our good behavior and with our rule keeping. This is the essence of of legalism, that somehow we can take God's commandments meant to run our lives on, and we're going to put them up against heaven to say, hey, God, I'm coming. I can make my way to you. I can be good enough. I can do the right thing. I can keep the rules. I can get to God. I can prove my moral fitness to him, and somehow I might make him happy. He'll open the door for me when I get there. Many people today, even Christians, are living by the ladder. They think that rules can help them reach God. They think that it might not even be the Old Testament law. Maybe it's some of the commandments in the New Testament, or maybe it's just some other religion that says, no, we can reach God, we can attain salvation through moral effort. We can make God happy with good works. This is not only a wrong belief, but scripture tells us this is a dangerous, possibly even a deadly belief. Galatians 3.10 says, for all who rely on the works of the law are under a curse. For it is written, cursed be everyone who does not abide by all things written in the book of the law and do them. You see, while the train track's on the ground, you can pull a tie out, you can miss something here or there, and the thing's not going to go off the track, right? Things can keep going. God's forgiveness, his grace covers that. We can keep running our lives along his track of obedience. But in a ladder, where it's step by step, every single rung is crucial. If you miss one, you come tumbling all the way down. God says you have to abide by all things written in the book of the law and do them. Every single of the 613 commandments, all the time, perfectly, no exceptions. Oh, you want, you want to reach me? <laughs> the only way to do it is to keep all of it. And if you don't, a curse is upon you. Anyone ever kept all of it? No. No. Therefore, we took the law, which was good and right, but because the sin in us said, hey, like Piper said, Satan makes the base of his operations the laws of God. He did that with Eve. When he started twisting God's commandments then, he does the same thing with us. He did the same thing with the Israelites. Let's twist this and go, hey, let's stand it on its head. God gave this to you so that you can, you can somehow reach him by keeping it. No. There is no being good enough to get ourselves into heaven. There is no climbing the ladder. We have all failed. We've all missed a rung. 
and therefore we are under a curse. One slip on the ladder, and down you go. This is why, my friends, legalism and rule-keeping is not and never will be the answer. James 2.10 says, For whoever keeps the whole law, yet stumbles at just one point, is guilty of breaking all of it. You can't make God happy by keeping rules. You can't reach God with rules. Rules don't help us get there. Not only that, but the rules that we have tried to keep, we have failed, and therefore, we are all under a curse. Bad news. (laughs) But there is good news. There is good news because of Jesus Christ. The moment I believe, the moment you believe, Christ frees me from the curse of the law, the curse that is on you and me for having even tried to get to God with our good behavior. Galatians 3, 13 and 14. Quick sum. You might be noticing he's quoting from Galatians a lot. Galatians is pretty much the entire book is written about this. If you have any questions about the law and how do we need to keep it all, just go read the book of Galatians. That's like what the whole book's about. And even the first half of Romans, a lot of it deals with this. Here's what Paul says in Galatians 3, 13 and 14. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. For it's written, cursed is everyone who is hung on a tree, not a T. I I mistyped that. He redeemed us in order that the blessing given to Abraham might come to the Gentiles, those of us who aren't Jews, might come to us through Christ Jesus, so that by faith we might receive the promise of the Spirit. Jesus stepped in. He stepped in and freed us from the curse of the law that we are under for having failed to keep the law. We are now free from the condemnation that comes from failing to keep the law. Jesus took our curse because he kept it perfectly, and instead he gave us the cure. By grace, through faith, we are forgiven. In the Old Testament, there was a custom of hanging bodies of lawbreakers from trees as a warning, as a message to the community. It's a bit like the Old West, right? Where the sheriff and his posse would get together the horse thieves and hang them up over the nearest tree. They would hang a sign from their, from their neck that says, Here is a no good, low down, bushwhack environment. So here's the thing we are all no good, low down, bushwhack environments. And we all deserve to hang from our own individual tree with that sign around our neck because we have failed to keep the laws of God. But Jesus Christ became a no good, low down, bushwhack environment for you and for me. He hung from the tree in our place so that his perfection might become ours instead. And so that the blessings of Abraham, being included in God's people, and the promise of the Spirit might come to us too. How do we reap the benefits of Jesus hanging on the tree? It's not by behaving. It's by believing. In international, we believe this to the core. In fact, that verse that cursed is anyone who was hung on a tree, referring to Christ, it's quoted in, in Acts as well when the apostles are preaching. That's one of the main reasons our church logo has the tree. Because that represents the cross, the tree that Jesus hung from. We don't attain the benefits of it by behaving, but by believing. So what does that mean for you and me today? It means that I am no longer under obligation to the law. Romans 10, 4, Christ ended the law so that everyone who believes in him may be right with God. It doesn't get much clearer than that. We are free from the law. We are under no more obligation to keep it. We are under no more obligation to join any other system of rules. The ladder, in a sense, lays back down where it belongs. The law that's been hanging over us, that's been pointing to our failures, that's been reminding us of our sin, goes away. Romans 6.14, you are not under a law, but under grace. Jesus has come and he's taken the curse 
of the ladder we couldn't climb. He's like, guys, let's put this back down where it goes. This was a way to live. I'm not sure what he said. Siri is talking to me. <laughs> Instead of earning your salvation with perfect obedience to God, Jesus earned salvation with perfect obedience in your stead. You receive his salvation by grace through faith. You are free from trying to make God happy. You are free from trying to earn something from him by keeping rules. Okay, Scott, if the law can't save us and Jesus has ended the law, does that mean I get to rip the Old Testament out of my Bible? No. Before you get the scissors out and cut even the first five books out, whoa, horses. No, you don't. The law is important. The law is good for us. In fact, the New Testament says that, that all Scripture is God-breathed. It is all good and useful for us. However, we have to handle the law the way that God intended it to be handled, as a track, not as a ladder. Even though we are free from the demands of the law, we are free from the penalties of the law, when we put the law back in its proper place, we find that there are at least three ways that the law is still very useful to us, that it is still very much in our favor to know it, to read it, to memorize it, to study it. And for mnemonic purposes, all three of those things will start with the same letter. Number one, we can use God's law to worship. God's law is perfect. It is good. It reveals to us more of who God is and what he's like. Because every commandment he gives is an extension of his character and his personality and who he is. So as we study his law, we can study him. We can come to know God more fully. We can worship him more accurately. Because while his commands may change, the principles underlying them don't. He is the same God yesterday, today, and forever. So number one is the, the, the laws kind of show us God, and that helps us worship him. The other way it helps us worship him is it points us to his son, points us to Christ. Jesus said that all the law and the prophets, which is the rest of the Old Testament, is talking about him, all of it. So that means you could open up your Old Testament and on any page, if you have eyes to see, you will run into the cross. You will meet the blood of the atonement. You will see Christ. It's all about him. So the law is constantly pointing us to Jesus. God's law reveals the disease of self that runs through our blood, the cancer fatal to our soul. The law shows us how every attempt on our behalf has failed to bring this sickness under control. Words by DC Talk in their song, In the Light, from 1995. And so when you read the law, it should cause you to worship God. It should cause you to read this stuff and go, especially if you read the Old Testament, you run into some weird, goofy, crazy, really difficult sounding law. Just go, man. God, I could never have kept this to make myself right with you. Thank you for sending Jesus. Thank you for sending your son to save me despite my incompetence, to save me from my sins. It can lead you to know Jesus and to worship him more fully. So the first thing the law does causes us to recognize God, worship him, to give him glory for who he is and what he's done. First reason the law is absolutely worth our time, our study, our attention, and our preservation. Second, the law of God helps us with our walk. In our walk with God is what I mean by that. And this is really what the law was given for in the first place, right? It was given so that God's people could walk with him, so that they could learn how to live their lives in obedience to him, so that God could save them from pain and heartache by living the way that he's commanded us to live, which is for our good and for the good of those around us, loving God and loving others. Jesus said you could summarize every single rail on here with love God and love people. That's why those are two statements that are part of our purpose statement at our church. 
Now, the law can teach us valuable principles about God. So you have to understand this. The law was still given to the Israelites, right? Like, it's not given to Christians. It's not given to you and to me. It is given for us, but it was not given to us. Do you understand the difference? Like, it was given to them. It is for our benefit that it's still here, that we get to study it, but it's not for us. Or, sorry, the other way around. It's not to us. So these commandments were God's commandments to the Israelites in their time, in their place, living in Canaan. So that means that some of the laws aren't going to be applied the same way in your life and in my life today. Some of them might be. Maybe it'll transfer over. Maybe not. How can you tell? Here's what you do. Under every command in the Old Testament is a universal, enduring principle that's still there for you and for me. All right? Because God doesn't change. So the principle that underlies the command that he gave is, is universal. And that principle does still apply. That does is still, man, I should live my life like that. I should do that. As one author said, he says that the law is a paradigm of timeless ethical, moral, and theological principles. And that interpreters, us, we must discover the timeless truth beneath its cultural husk. For example, the command in Leviticus 5.2 to not touch any unclean animals. Okay, well, the underlying purpose for that, the underlying principle is God is holy. God is set apart. God is pure. God is clean. Therefore, God wants his people to be pure, to be holy, to be set apart, and to be clean. Now, the application for that isn't probably going to be we have to avoid bacon. Praise Jesus. Right? But that might mean there's certain things we don't do. Certain places we don't go. Certain groups we might not hang out with. Certain websites we might not visit because they would defile us. It would be like touching an unclean animal. We'd be bringing something impure into our lives, which is not who God is, which is not how he works. So you see that studying the Old Testament, there's a, a universal principle under every law, even the crazy-sounding ones, like stoning somebody who puts wheat and oats next to each other in a field. There is a reason God gave that. You can study that reason and go, okay, how does that principle apply in my life? God, how can I live this out in my walk with you, not in my own power, but trusting in the power of your spirit, being led by faith to obey you more, to walk with you down this track that you've called me to walk down? God wants us to walk with him, but in the context of his grace. Does God have commands for us to do? Absolutely. There's like 800 of them even in the New Testament. But he means them as a track, not as a ladder. And that's the importance of understanding the law. All right, so God's, word, God's law can help us worship him, help us walk with him. Lastly, it can help us witness. Why did God ultimately give the Ten Commandments? To illuminate people for their need for a Savior, right? Just make us aware of the sin. We can use it in that same way today. 1 Timothy 1, 8 and 9, Paul says this. He says, we know that the law is good if one uses it properly. We also know that the law is made not for the righteous, but for the lawbreakers and the rebels, for the ungodly and the sinful, for the unholy and the irreligious. Okay. So to use the law properly, according to the New Testament, means that we give it to the people it's intended to reach. The lawbreakers, the rebels, the ungodly, the sinful, the unholy, and the irreligious. That's whom the law is intended to reach. The law is not given for Christians or righteous people to obey and keep score. The law is intended to reach lawbreakers and sinners, people who are far from God. How does it help them? It helps them recognize their sin. It helps them recognize their need for a Savior. It helps them hopefully turn to Christ as they repent from their sin. The problem, though, is today almost everybody thinks that they're a good person, right? If you ask somebody, uh, you know, do you think you'll get to heaven? Yeah. Why? Well, I've been good enough to get to heaven. Okay, so that approach failed. How, how else can we maybe get at this to demonstrate to someone that, no, 
No, you're not good enough to get to heaven. We can't climb the ladder. Well, maybe just bring up the Ten Commandments. Say, hey, the Ten Commandments, do you believe those are what we have to do to get into heaven? That that might be, you know, if there were a ladder, that would be, those would be ten important rungs. Most people would probably say, yeah. Say, okay, well, how have you done with them? Oh, I may have broken one or two, but nothing too big. I've murdered anybody. Say, okay, well, let's start with number one. Um, you shall have no other gods before me. Have you always made God the priority in your life? Nope. And we see it right there. Instantly, every single one of us is, is convicted. We know. No, I haven't done that. And so just by that, you could walk someone through the Ten Commandments, through the law, and show them or have them see how they have failed to obey God's law, how they've already missed a rung on the ladder. Now, here's the important part. In that moment, it is not our job to judge them. That is not our job is to judge them. It is our job to hold up God's law and to let the Holy Spirit convict and judge them, for them to judge themselves against this law. All right, John 14, the Holy Spirit's going to convict the world of righteousness and sin. You and I don't have to. Okay, I'm not saying we throw this law at lost people. You're going to hell because you didn't forget us. Not going to be helpful. All right, the approach is: Hey, here is God's law. How do you think you measure up? Yeah, you're under a curse, just like me, just like I was. Yet, there's a savior. There's a righteousness and a salvation that has come to us apart from the law, and that is through Christ. And hopefully we can lead that person toward the gift of salvation. You see, the law is a gift given to people who are still far from God. It's not intended to be a ladder. It's intended to be railroad tracks. It beckons people to repent of their sin and to turn to Christ, to accept what he did on the cross in their stead, that he hung on a tree so we don't have to. And when a person does that, when a person trusts in Christ, they'll be free from trying to make God happy. Because the moment you believe, God frees you from the law. We're no longer under the law, but we live under grace. That does not mean that the law is useless to us now. Handled rightly, as a track, not as a ladder, the commandments of God can help us worship him, help us walk closer with him, and to witness to others about our great and mighty Savior. Let's pray.